In this video, I want to talk about international responses to a changing Arctic. I included several background videos in this playlist to give you a sense of the size and scale of the changes that are occurring and the extent to which powerful and less powerful actors are, are adapting to this changing um, environmental uh, factor that we haven't really talked about that much over the course of the course over the course of the class the Arctic is a long way from Australia however it is strategically important for a number of major international players as we saw in the videos Russia the US Canada China Korea Japan uh, a number of uh, European actors as well all are touched on by this ice uh, this um, this previously ice bound uh, area in which humans never reached the the north pole until a little over a, a century ago and how this has created an opportunity for what hasn't been a real battle yet it's again you need to be careful defining your terms but it is a strategic challenge and potentially an opportunity right if you can have um, uh, ships avoiding um, uh, areas of uh, of potential danger, whether it be accidents in the Suez Canal, uh, pirates off the Horn of uh, Africa, or in this, uh, the, um, the off the coast of Indonesia and, and Singapore. This could speed up uh, international uh, shipping and could benefit all theoretically. Um, this is also really an area of fascinating history for exploration uh, from uh, Commander Perry to uh, Michael Palin who went, uh, he had a documentary series. He is one of the, uh, the original Monty Python members, had a documentary series in which he went around the world in 80 days. Then he had one in which he went from the North Pole uh, to the South Pole. Then he did another one, I think, that went around the border of the Pacific. Uh, but it, in a lot of ways, is really fascinating. This Pole to Pole documentary series is right at the end of the Cold War, going through a number of uh, areas that have seen a huge um, uh, um, cultural change. Um, but yeah, and you can get other, I think if you have enough money, you can, you can get a, a tourist ticket on a boat to go to the North Pole as well. But I find his a lot more entertaining to go to. Um, on the other side of the world is the South Pole in which the U.S. flag flies its flag on a research base at the geographic, uh, South Pole, which could arguably be seen as a statement about, uh, uh, geopolitical power or interest. It's been there since uh, initial uh, explorations. Sir Edmund Hillary was one of the first, part of one of the first groups that went overland in, in machines in the 1950s. Um, but it's been another area that we're not going to focus on today. But it also is a really fascinating area that's seen uh, disproportionate climate uh, shifts due to the extre extremes of its weather. But today we're going to focus on, on the Arctic. So the changing weather and subsequent politics of the Ar Arctic, I think it's really interesting. This is one of those areas in which climate change is moving uh, like the Sahel in, uh, in earlier weeks, twice as fast as the, as the rest of the world, leading to the dramatic decline in uh, ice cover that we saw in that first video from uh, NASA. Uh, there's a little risk, current risk of war, but there's a lot of maneuvering for economic or political advantage. And I, I think the sea ice melt in the videos make clear that there's a number of challenges, both economically, how can, how can states uh, agree to either um, extract the resources in a safe way or potentially like with the Antarctic Treaty, not uh, conduct any economic uh, activity in such a fragile area. Um, uh, military, we saw the movements and the training and the difficulty in being able to respond to challenges there. Uh, environmental uh, challenges uh, and technological as well to try to operate in such a harsh environment. What are the kind of main economic factors? The videos touch on these, but I think it's it was hard for me to try to wrap my head around the size and scale of the the resource base that that uh, could potentially be underneath the ice. Um, there's estimates of ninety up to ninety billion barrels of oil in the Arctic which dwarfs the current proven reserves of even the largest producers like Saudi Arabia, um, which current uh, reserve is 266,000 um, uh, million barrels uh, of oil. 
So, uh, and natural gas, also the proven reserves there dwarf even the largest producers like Russia. So there's really an unprecedented amount of resources there. And as the resources run dry in other parts of the world, the, the potential value of them uh, would raise um, here, even though it might cost more to extract. There's an interesting um, dilemma about how much you're willing to invest in extracting the oil versus other kinds of resources that are coming online and becoming more economically compelling over the recent decades as we've seen in the last couple of weeks. What are the environmental changes uh, that pose a challenge? Uh, as the ice uh, recedes, fish stocks are moving north to try to, to move to, cool, to cooler waters or waters that were consistent to what they were um, designed or evolved for. Uh, animals that depend on those, animal, uh, those fish are also moving north as well. And polar bears, because they spend a large amount of uh, time on the water, and they don't have the ability to swim long distances, arguably could become extinct in the first half of this century, but before probably I become a grandparent, they could uh, disappear. There's a lot of different interesting reports on that. You can see here the trends in uh, polar bear subpopulations around the Arctic, the areas that are often the, the most declining are those that are um, next to uh, geographical areas in which they've long uh, long been based in, off the coast of Canada uh, and Alaska. There's a number of population challenges as well to a declining ice-covered Arctic. The indigenous populations, as, as you saw in the fault line videos, have to adapt to those changing wildlife patterns that I mentioned just a second ago, and the economic and political changes, as in the fault lines video in which you have economic opportunities and profit sharing in, uh, amongst these populations, similar to what I mentioned in Alaska in previous weeks. There's also transportation challenges that I mentioned because it is so harsh even now and so far away. Um, some things would be easier with less ice being able to open up the North Northwest Passage for year-round travel. There was a a non-ice breaking boat that, that did the Northwest Passage in the winter a couple of years ago. First time in history that that's happened. It would now enable avoiding piracy, as I mentioned earlier. Tourism will be easier. Uh, there's not enough icebreakers to really open up the initial paths. The U.S., I mean, this is one way the U.S. has really fallen behind um, its, uh, its Russian challengers. Uh, U.S. is just as much icebreakers as Australia, even though the U.S. has a number of different resource research bases in the Antarctic, as well as interests in patrolling the areas near where they control in the Arctic as well. Um, yeah, there's risk for non-icebreaking ships to be damaged, and to be able to search and rescue people who might be on those boats is also incredibly difficult compared to most other places in the world. I mentioned the, uh, the Australia has a new, new icebreaker, me as a taxpayer, and likely you as an Australian taxpayer has helped to pay for it. We bought it actually a while ago, back in 2016. It took a while to build, to ship, and it is now in service. The RSV Nuyina, I'm probably murdering that pronunciation, is now in active service to supply Arctic uh, re or research bases based out of Hobart. You can now watch uh, the live webcams, or when I watched it, it wasn't quite live, but it was quite recent, um, where where the, it's being deployed to be able to help secure and to forward Australia's uh, um, research capabilities down in, in Antarctica. Spent over a billion dollars on it. Um, getting to efforts for international governance and cooperation related to the Arctic, the earliest um, Arctic Treaty, the Svalbard or Spitsbergen Treaty, of um, 1925 gave Norway the rights to the Spitsbergen group of Arctic islands, which was uh, in that CNN uh, video in the playlist, with, was within 200 kilometers or something from uh, the Russian islands that they were placing those big guns on. Um, there's now 40 signatories, including countries that are quite far away from the Arctic, like, uh, like India and South Korea. It sets up a 200 nautical mile buffer zone around it, uh, which caused a lot of disputes with the Soviet Union and then after the Soviet Union, uh, Russia. And it also shows the importance of, um, of uh, 
scientific knowledge about where the continental shelf is and where that 200 nautical mile line is to be able to try to seek man, uh, maximum advantage. And with any kind of governance efforts, it's always tougher to try to decide, do you work within an existing treaty framework or do you try to come up with something uh, new? Uh, and I think with this, you see the examples with the UN Security Council. I mean, it's created, it's getting a bit long in the tooth now, right? Over 70 years old. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization, there was a big, um, a large amount of uncertainty after the end of the Cold War, whether NATO should still go forward. Um, the Trump administration act actively tried to weaken NATO and say that it was no longer uh, relevant. However, now with the Russian-Ukrainian conflict, I think there's newfound interest in NATO and a couple, uh, a couple of countries, uh, Sweden and Finland, have expressed interest in joining uh, NATO. So you can see how the existing organizations can fall out of favor or uh, uh, fit for service concerns for some time. And then it can be quite dramatically different given new, um, new challenges. I can think of a number of different examples of governance to try to make it a bit more concrete and apply it to the Arctic as opposed to um, uh, NATO. And I think for me, I'll kind of uh, put norms a bit differently um, here as opposed to where I did before. I'll start with norms for the amount of governance that's involved. Norms don't involve any governance because they're just self-governed uh, uh, perceptions about what acceptable behavior is in individuals. Start with bilateral cooperation, the Inuit Circumpolar Council, the Arctic Council, UN Convention on the Laws of the Sea, and then the International Maritime Organization as moving from less coordination, less actors, to more and more systematic approaches. So let's start with international norms. There's an observable norm towards at least giving lip service uh, towards global environmental protection, making sure that the resource you extract is done in a sustainable manner, and protecting for people uh, protections for people who are affected by the resource extraction. Some of these norms have led to some of the creation of the organizations and the meetings, right? Like the Palau meeting that I started uh, today with, to um, to the uh, to the Arctic Council and others, which we'll get to. Um, the they've helped further and internalize new norms. However, I, I think. Um, the environmental protection and sustainable growth norms haven't really been internalized to the point of preventing the kind of global negative externalities that the IPCC uh, talked about in the previous video. Bilateral cooperation would be the second form of international governance related to the Arctic. A uh, couple of examples that I was able to think of um, going back to the original 1923 bilateral um, <coughs> Halibut Commission, the International Pacific Halibut Commission uh, between Canada and the U.S. If you haven't had halibut, it's absolutely delicious. Those, these things can be two meters long. Uh, 1988 Bilateral Arctic Cooperation Agreement regarding the Northwest Passage, also between Canada and the U.S., longtime allies. 1988 Agreement between the government of the U.S. and the USSR on mutual fishery regulations that created the... Um, Intergovernmental Consultative Commission, so you can see more functionalist areas of cooperation relating to fishing as those early bilateral efforts. If a fishery exists uh, off the coast of two countries and there wasn't that s similar kind of global fishing fleet that there is today, these kind of bilateral treaties were fit for purpose because it was easy to coordinate. There's only two actors and it was easier to reach an agreement. Um, those would be uh, a step up from norms, but still relatively easy to implement because there were only two countries. So only two countries that need to um, reinforce it. Uh, another kind of cooperation example that I would say that is a bit more involved than that, a bit more systematic and involves different types of actors would be the Inuit Circumpolar Council. It first met in 1977. It was a multinational NGO uh, representing around 160,000 Inuit peoples in the areas bordering the Arctic. It has a general assembly meeting every four years, and they um, were clear that it was their right to freely determine their political status, freely presume their economic, social, cultural, and linguistic development, and freely pursue their natural wealth and resources. 
which I think is interesting and relevant in connecting to the the importance of cultural and social identity that the IPCC and other reports mention, and natural wealth to be able to have some stake in controlling it or benefiting from it, similar to the natural resources challenges that we saw in previous weeks. Um, they have um, they have a website if you're curious, and their um, last meeting was in Alaska. And the next meeting is actually later on this year, but because of COVID, they're making it entirely virtual. Um, so you see a regular series of meetings, regular coordination of interests and advocacy that has greater impact because they are coordinated, arguably. The next step up would be the Arctic Council. This is an organization meant of, uh, made of nation states. It's not officially an international organization, but a forum to try to encourage cooperation and collaboration. It, uh, it doesn't have a permanent headquarters, though there is, uh, there is ongoing meetings. You can see where the members of the Arctic Council are. They rotate uh, their, their um, membership. You can see where the vast majority of the population lives um, in the countries that, that border that region. I think it's it's really interesting as this kind of main international um, forum for talking about um, Arctic issues. They also have a number of different working groups that work towards understanding the impact of behavior and how the collaboration can be increasingly um, practical between uh, Arctic states, indigenous communities, and other inhabitants um, to be able to encourage sustainable development. Um, they have members, as I showed in the previous graph, Canada, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, Russia, Sweden, and the US. And they mainly take action in, in six working groups, although they do, hel they do hold ministerial meetings. Um, like, uh, I, I love the photos from awkward international conferences, now especially that they're, that they're um, safely uh, spaced from each other with, with the photographs. But you can see the Sergey Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister there, and uh, Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of State for the U.S. Uh, in the front, as well as the other stakeholders from the other major states. However, most of the activity is actually in the working groups. They have six. And I think looking at the organizational structure of some of these international organizations goes a long way to try to understand what issues they find the most interesting, or compelling, or important. So the first one is, uh, in no particular order, the Contaminants Action Program to try to reduce emissions and other pollutants into the area. The next one is the Monitoring and Assessment Program to get better information and data about the people who live in the area, the ecosystems, and provide scientific advice to address the um, government's response to climate change and, and pollution. Conservation of Arctic Flora and Fauna Working Group to try to uh, encourage the sustainability of their living resources in the area. Emergency Prevention and Preparedness Working Group, which uh, connects to the technological challenge of search and rescue and being able to uh, protect the citizens there from the potential release of pollutants uh, or, uh, or um, uh, nuclear fallout. Uh, the Arctic Marine Environment Working Group pr uh, protects the marine environment. One of the other group working groups protected the living environment on land. This one focuses on the sea resources. Um, and the sustainable development uh, is more connected to the communities who live in the affected areas. So you can see the different areas of um, trying to, to reduce uh, pollution, to try to protect the environment in different areas and then to try to protect the, the people. Moving quite quickly now to another level of coordination and systemizing uh, relations between states. Uh, the most dramatic example of that that I could think of is the UN Convention on the Laws of the Sea. It re replaced and superseded four treaties from back in the 1950s. It was created in 1982, and it includes... Um, uh, rights for countries that, that have um, a border or are connected to the continental shelf, an ocean border that extends beyond uh, 200 nautical miles from the shoreline to be able to claim resources that extend 50 nautical miles beyond that. 
I think it is quite important for the for the rights and who uh, says that they can control the resources up in the Arctic because of where the continental shelf is. Uh, of course, the U.S. doesn't exactly um, have a great track record for ratifying a lot of, of more rigorous international organizations or treaties. So the U.S. has ratified the U.N. Convention on the Laws of the Sea, though it it argues that it relies on customary laws, which often have proven quite similar. Uh, Article 76 has been problematic as part of the uh, UN Convention on the Laws of the Sea because submissions of area claims are not visible to other states until after they have been considered. And in recent years, there's been concern that Russia has lodged a, um, a, uh, a claim to certain parts of the Arctic region um, and provide evidence to support it, but the other affected states in the Arctic haven't been able to see Russia's claim and uh, and or be able to counter it or put forward their own claim, which could cause some tangentious international um, issues given the current state of relations between the U.S. and, uh, and the West and Russia right now. This is the uh, signing back in the 1980s. Next would be the International Maritime Organization, hosted in sunny London. Um, it, I think, is arguably one of the, the most directly impactful for the largest number of people in 2022 because it transports more than 80% of global trade. It was created in 1948 as a specialized agency within the UN, like the UN Food Program um, and a whole bunch of other uh, UNICEF and other specialized organizations. It was created as a global standardized setting authority for safety, security, and environmental performance of international shipping. Its main role is a regula regulatory framework for the shipping industry that's, that, that the goals are to be fair, effective, universally adopted, and universally implemented. I think it is quite amazing the changes that the international shipping system has witnessed since 1948. They've adopted some 50 conventions and protocols, adopted more than a thousand codes and recommendations. Often these kind of functionalist focused organizations that focus on one specific and important problem. In my international relations classes, I often use the example of other international treaties and organizations regulating um, uh, mail across borders and uh, flights of airplanes across borders as areas in which the benefits of mutual cooperation are dramatically high and the costs of doing it your own either unilaterally or bi bilaterally are much higher and so it gives a lot of incentive to work together and set standards. It also um, uh, uh, all these uh, uh, codes and recommendations to try to reduce pollution and it spearheaded a lot of efforts to try to um, fight piracy off the coast of the eastern coast of uh, Africa, Somalia, and the Straits of uh, Malacca over the last 20 years. I think, for me, um, I, I think probably a lot of the things that I have have come through uh, international shipping from various parts of the world. Um, when I moved to Australia, we put it all in a shipping container uh, and shipped it around. and. I never knew the extent to which you can monitor international shipping uh, level of detail than when I shipped all of our stuff here. And it's it, all of our stuff, the last shipment went on the Bremen Express uh, back in 2016 through a lot of these areas that are protected through the International Maritime Organization. The IMO has a connect to the Arctic. They passed their 2009 guidelines regulating ships operating in the polar waters. It uh, also uh, acceded to the International Code for Ships Operating in Polar Waters and related amendments to make it mandatory um, for the safety of life at sea and prevention of pollution, which helps coordinate um, uh, search and rescue in the area as well as to try to reduce pollution of those ships and it was granted observer status to the Arctic Council. So you can see, uh, like the, uh, a lot of the, um, the, the Inuit um, Council, they're not official members of the Arctic Council, though they do have observer status similar to the uh, IMO as well, because often the agreements made by state actors in the Arctic Council have implications for, for how international organizations operate. 
So yeah, that's a lot there to kind of recap the international responses to a changing Arctic. Um, I place them because I think it's a useful way to think or group them in, along an axis from low to high levels of cooperation, from norms to large international agreements like the International Maritime Organization. Uh, there's a lot of uh, different kinds of activities all geared towards trying to um, use lessons from the past to try to reduce pollution, environmental concerns, look after the populations in the affected areas, and to reduce areas for potential conflict between major actors. Um, however, the speed in which there are these kind of dramatic changes um, shows that there needs the number of mitigation adaptation strategies at milit I can't get it. Mitigation and adaptation strategies have to be developed in a more rapid manner, and a lot of them are um, subject to political changes in international capitals, which connect it back to international politics and domestic politics. Uh, I mean, Russia just suspended involvement in the International Space Station because of the ongoing conflict in 2022, and so you see long-held international cooperative agreements buckle under the changing pressures of international relations. And so with the Arctic, I think also we have to think about how there's been substantial efforts of cooperation, but how susceptible they are to the pressures and whims of um, militarized actors in major capitals very far away, which is kind of uh, segueing away to, um, to the the video I mentioned before that I asked you to watch, the Fault Lines video, what provocative act did Russia uh, do back in 2007 in the Arctic to try to bring attention to its claims in the Arctic region, connecting, of course, to that 250 nautical mile continental shelf uh, claim that I mentioned earlier. So if you've watched the video, it should stand out to you. If you care to answer the question, please do so on Waddle. And with that, I'll end this video on international responses to a changing Arctic and take a step back and conclude the class and the semester in a bittersweet fashion by touching on some of the major themes of the class, where we've come, what we've learned, and what we can take with us as we go beyond this class.